let's start with the evidence of the flood. First of all, Jesus mentioned and made a clear reference to the flood with uh, his words. He says, as were the days of Noah, as in the days before the flood, they were eating until the day of Noah entered the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. That's in Matthew 24. The point is this, that if Jesus mentioned that so clearly, so literally, we, we cannot say that this is not true, or this is just symbolic. It's true, it's real. That should be enough to say, okay, that's it, proved. But let's go into more details. Late on the 18th century, old people believed in this, that the sedimentary rocks were part of the fossils, and fossils were there, were part of the Genesis flood. There were no questions about But suddenly came a group of people called the Enlightenment, which they believed that they had better explanation for all this. And the explanation were man's reasoning. And they were uh, in opposition to Moses. So they didn't want Moses to be the one leading these ideas. So they committed to the ideas of millions of years, mainly James Hutton and later uh, Charles Lyell. And they did uh, a full story about millions of years, but without any proof. There was no scientific, scientific proof of this. It was just their own perception. So the people that should have defended all this creation and flood were the clergy, the, the religious people, but they did not do any defense of this. The clergy definitely did not defend, but the flood never was proved wrong, was just left there. So a lot of years passed until these two men, John Whitcomb and Henry Morris wrote a book called The Genesis Flood. And this book was the uh, changer, made a big change in the perception of people about the flood. We can say that the universal flood is very relevant to the Christian faith. Just because the flood makes a, a totally different perception on what will happen. Uh, and in fact, we need millions of years for the evolution even to look possible. So the, it's very well, well needed, the uh, flood, to be out of the picture so they can sustain the, the position. So what is a, a fact is that un, uh, underneath all the creation, we have a lot of very animals. There is death, suffering, and disease. And this is a fact. The question is, where did all these fossils came from? And the, there are two possibilities. One is, um, <clears throat> so one is that it, this happened because of evolution, because of a lot of time, millions of years, just accumulating different fossils, layers, and all that. And the other one is a big, fo a big flood that happened and just took over all this in one year and 17 days. The ark. Let, let's go a little bit into the ark in detail. So God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come for before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of coffin wood, Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. This is a real technical information. And let me show you why. First of all, was he, he was told, ark of gopher wood. Secondly, make rooms. Then cover it inside and outside with pitch. And then he gave the dimensions, 300 cubits, 50 cubits, 30 cubits in height. And then different decks, lower, second, and third decks. So Noah worked with his sons and many other people that lived at that time. They didn't survive to live during the flood, and uh, they just, but they just cooperated with them. 
But Ellen White makes a very important comment here. She says, it was a building of great durability, which no wisdom of man could invent. God was the designer and Noah his master builder. Right? So he defines well, because there's a lot of criticism about Noah not knowing how to build a ship. Never did it before, so how could he do it? Well, he had 120 years to do it, first of all. And secondly, he was just a builder, the master builder. He wasn't the designer. And definitely they have some advanced technology at that time that they could use to their advantage. There's a safety investigation done by Korean naval engineers, which uh, they put a lot of good information about the ark, the analysis of the ark. They did three, the analysis in three major areas, structural safety, overturning stability, and sea keeping uh, equality of the ship. So let's go first for the Ark of Gopherwood. Gopherwood is not a specific wood. It is a very hard wood though. And here we have a, a table with all the woods that anyone that goes over 1,000 kilos per cubic meter is very strong, very hard. But, and also sinks, when you put it on the water, it sinks because it's too strong, too dense. And uh, the trees they used were probably very tall trees, 10 meters, and with a, uh, with a weight that would mean that the ark weighed about 4,000 tons. The spirit of frosty tells us something more. The race of men, the living, were of very great stature and possessed wonderful strength. The trees were vastly larger and far surpassing in beauty and perfect proportion anything mortals can now look upon. The wood of these trees was of fine grain and hard substance, in this respect more like stone. It required much more time and labor, even of that powerful race, these trees were of great durability and would know nothing of decay for many years, very many years. So the, because these trees were so dense, so strong, they, that were very able to support all the stresses that that ship would have. On sea, a boat suffers a lot of stresses and compression. And that was the very vital point of this design. So that was one point. Second was make rooms in the ark. Just you can see here all the rooms that would contain the animals. And this is because of something that in naval architecture, uh, you call it the free surface problem. It's a big problem. To have a book with free surfaces is a danger that can just collapse. What is free surface? It's a ship that has a hole like this, with, this is all full with fish, that goes from one side to the other. So when the, um, the ship tilts to one side, all the cargo will go to that side, like this. So the center of gravity will move to that side. So the next wave will just turn and tilt, not tilt, but turn the capsize to that ship. So how you solve that? Doing compartments like that. And this is exactly what they did. Make compartments. So you will contain all the animals in their place. So they will not have a shift of center of gravity. You are with me? Good. So they put in all this distribution. This belongs to a study, a feasibility study, done by John Woodmerup. Okay. And then cover it inside and outside with pitch. So what is the meaning of this? The pitch. Uh, sometimes we have uh, critics of some people saying that pitch wasn't produced until after the, the, the flood because pitch supposedly comes from petrol, from petroleum, oil. But it's, that is not the case. This, we are talking here about pine pitch, which is very well used in the um, marine techniques. It's, it's very well known. And the pitch, this is from the trees, the pine trees, 
and you can have a pitch that is very strong and can do water tightness of all the planks very, very good. So it's very, very good for this use. And we have an extra, which normally is not discussed. The impact resistant test. Because of the, plan the planks, the wood was covered with pitch inside and outside. Look what happened. In a design show uh, called Miss Busters, Miss Busters, they did a, they conduct an experiment with uh, spraying the surface with polyuterate, like a pitch. And if they check if they had, they were blast proof, so at first they blast with C4, an explosive, one without any pitch, and make a big hole. Then they repeat the test with with another plank, same quality, and they put pitch inside and outside. And when they they blast that C4 just did no damage to the wood. Now, what's, what's the problem here? That the ark had to go to the sea with millions of trees floating. So the wood could bang the, the sides of a ship, make a hole. But didn't make a hole because it was protected. By what? The pitch. You see? So two reasons. Water tightness and also the resistance to the bangs. The other thing that I was told, they have internal ramps and three levels there. And this will give major structural safety to the ship. The, if you compare now the size of the ship, the Ark, this is the size of the Ark, compared to the Titanic, the Queen Mary, the Wyoming, and the Santa Maria of uh, Columbus. Look at that, uh, this in a debate with Bill Nye, he said, how come the Ark could be a wooden ship so big? And he said, that's not possible, because a wooden ship like that will sink because of the, um, of the movements that a ship can have in the rough sea, like turning up and down, all this way. So he said, it cannot pass the test. Oh. So what, what was his, uh, the reason to say that? He told the story about the Wyoming. This ship is here. And he said the Wyoming was a ship built by the best experts in the world in America. And that ship went out and sunk. Wow. So everyone was just, was a little bit sort of questioning what happened here. But that wasn't the truth. Remember the best lie is the one that you mix true and error. And this was that case. What happened with the Wyoming? In effect, the Wyoming went to sail, and it worked loading and unloading coal for 17 years. And after 17 years working, it had a big storm, and it sank, and everyone was killed. But after how many years? 17 years working. How many years we want the art to be on the sea? Just one. Even less than one, because the art was stranded in the, in the top of the mountain much before the end of the flood. So, next one is the, the length. was well, 300 cubits, 50 cubits, and 30 cubits. You may say, okay, it's a big ship. Yes, it is, compared with the transatlantic. An, or, a, or a truck, or a person. Yes, it is very big. But what about the proportions? Proportion is everything in a ship. And the proportion, length to wide, is one to six. And the proportion, or six to one, is the optimum for optimum stability. And today, modern ships have though that proportion, six to one, because it's the best. Now, this is the Bible, and the Bible is telling us, until through Moses, many, many years ago. And he was right spot on with six to one. And also, the ark should be exposed to a very rough seas, and having tension and compression in its structure. But there, God indicated a proportion of ten to one, length to high. Okay, so 
that lengths to high proportion, 10 to 1, is perfect for all this rough sea that has to go through it. So that's one position with a wave in the middle, or the next one, it's with two waves in the, in the two extremes. 10 to 1, the optimum. Also, stability, because of the, of this, of the uh, form, the shape of the ship, was optimum. Because we have here the, um, the half form is the one that determines that. And uh, we have a perfect half form, and we have a writing arm, which is just perfect for this ship. They say that this ship could um, uphold about 60 to 90 degrees tilt, and nothing would happen. We'll always go back into the vertical position. But not just that. The ship was designed not to have the maximum comfort or the maximum strength or the maximum stability. It was right in the middle. So it was um, taking all the three best considerations, but in the middle, having all of them. So that was a design. So there was 120 years of opportunity for people to repent and to go into the ark as they were invited. Now, the animals that were invited to get in, uh, we, have, we, we have not to be deceived that these were millions of animals, because they were not. Because uh, some people said that there could be 10 to 100 million species that should go in. That is not the case. Because the majority of plants, insects, and marine species that were not in the ark, were not part of the ark. And also, or other animals, which were vertebrates, were sea animals. And Woodmerop, the one that did the feasibility study, calculates the species that had to go into the ark, there are about 8,000. So, Adam, uh, could Adam put the names of each one of those animals? So it's the same story. The, the Bible says, in Genesis 2.19, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he could call him. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam did not have to go around looking for these sad animals and tracking them into the ark. So what, what were the animals that he had to name? all the livestock, birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. But there's no indication that he named any fish, or any marine organism, or any insects, beetles, or arachnids. So, from the total, from those millions, 98% are invertebrates, which he didn't name. And they're marine species. The remaining 2% are about 40,000. But of those, 25,000 are marine vertebrates and 4,000 amphibians. And of those, Adam had to name only 2,500 protospecies, which is genera. And from those, if he named uh, one animal every five seconds, it would only take three hours and 45 minutes to complete the task. See, it's perfectly possible. And God's purpose for this, giving names to them, was to reinforce the idea that all were different kind to human. And he needed, a, for physical, emotional, intellectual, a companion, Eve. So, how many animals were there? We had 9,300 square meters to put all the animals. Mammals, 7,428, 28%. Birds, 4,602, 3%. Reptile, 3,724, 15%. In total, 15,754. Animals using a 46% of the area of the ark. The rest of the area was used for food storage, water, and North family. Okay? If we look at that area, 9,300 square meters is very big. This is the, Mar the Maracanã Stadium in Rio de Janeiro. It's very big and has got only 7,140 square meters. 
So the area of the earth was much bigger than this. And you can see how many people it can it contains, it can take on board. So did every race have to go into the ark? No, definitely no. Not every dog, just one dog, what is called the ancestral dog, which had all the genes to produce all the races of dogs. So just a couple, one couple, because they were not clean. And the clean animals, by the way, are very uh, little in, num in number. So that's not a problem, that they had to take seven, seven couples. Science magazine in November 2002 produced a study with the following family findings. The origin of the domestic dog from wolves has been established. We examined the mitochondrial DNA sequence variation among 654 domestic dogs representing all major dog populations worldwide, suggesting a common origin from a single gene pool for all dogs' population. And the wolf was the, the first paternal ancestral dog. So Noah's Ark, uh, we have models in the world, like this in Hong Kong, this is a hotel. But we can see the size, it's done in proportion one to one. This is a bar and the side, and there's another one built in Holland in also one-to-one -one dimensions. And there's another one, the late one, is in Kentucky. It's a museum called the Encounter. It's a big ship, and I want to present you the inauguration of it with President, or former President Carter. was open two years ago now. All right, so animals uh, went to on board as in a sub supernatural act, which God directed them from there where they live into the ark. Obviously, he chose the best genetics of each animal, of each species. And there's one question that you can have, probably, that how could kangaroos uh, hop from Australia into the ark? That's a qu very common question. but. There was no Australia at, by then, because we have only one continent called the Pangaea. And God knew where he got all the animals from. So, after 120 years of appeal, Noah did a final call before the flood to repent, to come into the ark. And this is a very special thing. Remember how much, what percentage of the surface of the ark was occupied by the animals? Did you take that number in? 46%, 46%. So there was available more than half of the ark for other people to repent and to get in. So the beautiful thing here is that God, God disposed place, a place for them to, to uh, be accommodated into the ark. No one respond, that's fine, but the place was there for them. So then the door was shut by God. We know the Holy Spirit shut the door, and no more opportunities. Also, cats were just one pair of felines went into the ark. 
because all cats come from just one pair of, of feline. And the catastrophe is, comes now. In the year 600 of Noah's life, in the second month of the seventh day, 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep, and please be careful with this, all the fountains of the great deep first were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. So there's a, there's a, a um, sequence here. First the fountains of the great deep and then the windows of heaven. So what's the origin of the water in the flood? Yeah, rain, sure it was, but we have to take something into account. That air, atmosphere, can take only on board 55 grams per square per, uh, cubic meter of water. Cannot take any more. So that accounts only for 5 centimeters of water around the world. So definitely the clouds were not responsible for the water because they don't have the capacity. So who were? The fountains of the springs of the great deep. The water came from there in big columns of water jumping up into the air, spreading in the atmosphere and producing the rain. That didn't stop for 150 years, uh, sorry, days, days. Some people think that there was a water canopy around the, the earth and that was the source of all the water. And that is not the case because there, there's a lot of uh, technical uh, difficulties for accepting this. In one of them is just uh, temperature. If that happened, the temperature in the Earth should have reached 450 degrees centigrade, which is impossible for people to continue living. This is a model for catastrophic, catastrophic plate tectonic, tectonic, and this is a very nice model. And why is it a nice model? Because uh, explain all this. Now, from the side of a model. What is a model? A model is something that someone technical puts together his own ideas, how to describe that, how this all happened. It's not necessarily a thing that was measured and was repeatable, but it's something that is, is believable. This is a text, Amos 9.6. Who calls the waters of the sea and pours them on the face of the earth? The Lord is his name. You see, pour them on the face of the earth. <clears throat> what we know today, there are hundreds of thousands of submarine volcanoes in the ocean. And there is a line that I will show you straight away that shows that was, the land was broken. And probably that's what happened with all this column of water and superheated steam. Tsunami than just rain. 
So the spirit of prophets tell us that rain descended from the clouds above them. This was something that had never witnessed. <clears throat> and their hearts began to faint with the fear. The beasts were roving about in the wildest terror. The storm increased in violence until water seemed to come from heaven like mighty cataracts. The boundaries of river broke away and the waters rushed to the valleys. The foundation of the great deep were also broken up. Jets of water would burst up from the earth with indescribable force, throwing massive rocks hundreds of feet into the air, and then they would bury themselves deep in the earth. So, let's look at a little bit what we have in the, in the earth today. We have the crust, which we live in, but we have the mantle beneath. The mantle, we know that the mantle is plenty, and there is plenty of water there. There are some technical people believe that could be up to 20 times the water in the oceans in the mantle. And when we have a volcano, the ashes contain 70% of water. So that shows that there's a lot of water underneath. John Baumgartner put together this uh, model and he says that there should be large and rapid continental movements in this occasion. And this had to proceed inside, from inside the Earth. It's not an external meteorite, it's from inside the Earth. And it involved rapid subduction, sinking of one uh, plate into another. And so the floor ocean uh, was lifted, and that is what can reduce all this um, a tsunami like that. So it was lifted and then move all the water into the continent, or the, just the Pangaea. <clears throat> so, first phase, the Pangaea <clears throat> was broken into pieces with all these volcanoes, and this is the longest sea mountain we have today in the world, a mid-ocean range that is about 65,000 kilometers long. So everywhere in the world is there. This is a, as they call it, the longest mountain chain. And here we have the bottom of the seas today. This is how it looks today, all right? We can see clearly how they look. You see the open there in the middle? So, this is a continent separation. Oh, didn't work? Okay, never mind. So the continents start moving one uh, apart to the other. And they move in about for about 20 kilometers per hour when they were buried in the water. So they move and took their own, the, the current position. And the, when the continents collide one to the other, form the mountains. And here we have probably the effect of all that tsunami. That is terrible. This was in Japan some years ago. But we can see the strength, the force of a tsunami the effects that can have just one earthquake in the, in the world. So we have an evidence of escape, thousands, thousands of uh, tracks from animal tracks we can find in the world like this. Probably they were just floating and putting the, the tracks there in, in the, on the mud, mud. And we have dinosaur footprints and the sorry, going up in the mountains like that. And definitely was a, a, a dinosaur running in a stampede because they were afraid like that in here in Brisbane. And also here another another place with a big, big footprint. <clears throat> this is in WA, a sauropod, very big, big uh, footprints. So Genesis 7.21 tells us that, and all flesh died that moved on the earth birds and cattle, beasts and creeping things, and every man. So the art, the door was closed, the water was already there, and people was trying to escape and to try to get into the ark, but they couldn't. Okay? Spirit of prophecy tells us also that some of the people would bind their children and themselves upon powerful beasts, knowing that they would be tenacious for life and would climb the highest point to escape the rising water. The storm does not abate in its fury. The waters increase faster than at first, first. 
some fasten themselves to lofty trees upon the highest point of land, but these trees are torn up by the roots and carry with violence through the air, uh, with violence through the air, with stones and earth into the swelling, boiling below the waves. We have a today study that tells us that there were probably five sequences of the flood. As you may remember in the floods, in, in tsunamis, it's other parts of the world, <clears throat> it's not just one hit. They have many, many hits. And comes the sea goes back, and then it goes back with more strength. So in the case of the, the um, flood, uh, some technical people tell us that there are five sequences. Okay, so that is why we can find sometimes animals that were already buried and killed by the, the previous tsunami, that they were scavenged. So other animals eat their, their flesh. And that's why it, that happened. And the other, those animals that eat them were killed later with the next wave. Also, another interesting thing is that we can find many thousands of dinosaur eggs, because di the dinosaurs put eggs, like turtles. And what they do, they just lay the eggs and leave it there. And in this case, why we find eggs? If all the eggs, because they're alone, they hatch and they just continue life. But in this case, they were not. They were all fossilized. What happened there? It's obvious that there was the flood, bury them, and they couldn't hatch because they were fossilized. Okay? So we have the scene that all people are trying to to survive, but they were floating in the water, not being able to get into the ark. And that's probably one of the answers I can give you why we don't have human remains today. Human remains of pre-flood people, they're not existent. So I'm going to talk about, about that a little bit later. So we have these uh, phases in the, in the flood. First of all, 40 days of, of uh, rain. <clears throat> and then 150 days of flooding going up, water still going up. But then, after the 100 year, at the day 150, they start uh, the opposite uh, retreating stage, the water going out of the continents. And we have two stages here. One, water in sheets, very slow coming out and then water in channels, very strong and destroying water. Okay? So this was 221 days of retrieving waters. By the way, the ark stranded about here, at this stage, when still was soft water coming out. God protect the ark not to get involved in this water in channel, which would be very dangerous. <clears throat> Okay, so we have evidence in the geological scene about layers of the flood. And all of them mainly are all these sedimentary sediments that were placed uh, in 75% of the Earth's surface is full with these layers of uh, sediments. Here it's more clear, sedimentary rocks. And we can find it in Canada, in the Sydney Basin. It's only old sediments. Uh, and in the, this is the Three Sisters, I think, called in the Blue Mountains. This is all material deposed. And this is the way, the road from Sydney to Newcastle. Okay? You can see all the lines there, which are sedimentary rocks placed by the a flood. The same thing. And in, in Sydney, we have sandstone quarries where they cut the sandstone, which is our sedimentary, and they cut it and they place it in buildings. Also in China, got the same, like that. In Switzerland, in Cape Town, in South Africa, in the Amalfi Coast, in Italy, wherever you go, there are sedimentary rocks. Okay. Next one is in high mountains, like the Everest, this is the Everest, they have found a lot of marine fossils. Why? 
marine fossil like ammonites, trilobites, or uh, sea stars, and all kind of uh, algae or fish, and uh, how come they could be in that altitude? And the answer is just one, because at one time they were covered by water. And probably, I mean, obviously, the Everest was not in that high, it was much lower. And that, that was when they were covered by water, and the water carried all these fossils, or all these animals, which fossilized later. Same thing in the Andes ranges, a lot of ammonites and uh, other kind of animals which uh, they are marine. In Peru, giant oysters like this were placed in a, in a place called Acostambo at 3,200 meters of altitude. You see this? Okay, they're giant oysters and they were very alive. Why I say that? Because when an oyster is killed or dies, opens. It opens because the muscle that got there is the one that keeps them closed. So when they die, they just remain open. But all these are sealed, are all closed, which means that they were surprised. Suddenly, with a wave of mud, they were covered and they just didn't open. So there's a lot of evidence all around the world and in every corner of the world of all these reptiles and uh, fossils that it's just a matter of going and look at, uh, look at them. All they are in the sedimentary rocks. They're not in the volcanic rocks. They're in the sedimentary rocks, which are necessarily deposited by water. The other thing is that we have giant cliffs like this, white cliff of Dover, that goes around the world. Big, big um, limestone uh, deposits. This is the U.S. All this in, in yellow are the sediment, sedimentary deposits. In Australia, this big area are sedimentary deposits. It's also, a lot of material from the area of New York were carried to the Great Canyon, and they can determine that because of chemical analysis. How this could happen? A river cannot do that. It has to be a big event. Also, the lines between one deposit, one deposit and the next were just a straight line. In the, this is in the canyon, the um, Grand Canyon. Why is a straight line? Because there was no time for erosion, for barrows, for vegetation. There's no time. Because one came, one came after the other. You see, they're all straight lines there. By, by the way, don't think for one minute that this canyon was made by one river going there for millions of years. This is a great event. A lot of water in very short time. Also, we have uh, these layers that were bent like this. This cannot happen if this, each layer is millions of years after the other. Because if it's millions of years, it would be hard like rock. And if you try to, to bend them, it will just crack everywhere. But this is not. This is obviously was bent when it was uh, soft material. Same as here in, the, in Auckland, and same as all the other examples we have in nature. Also, we have submarine canyons. Everywhere in the world, there's submarine canyons. In the sea, you can see a canyon where a lot of draw rocks and material was was uh, carved and moved into the ocean, like this, the Pearl Submarine Canyon, or the Monterey Bay Submarine, you see? So the water coming from the continent, burying and carving all the rocks into a big deep. This place have up to 6,000 meters of uh, depth. All the blue thing is, is water today. Also in the bass trade in, in Melbourne, this is uh, the bus Strait between, that's Melbourne and this Tasmania. We have also big deep there. La Fonera in Spain, same thing, and so on, so on. So what happened then, until when we got to the zenith, the top 350 year, uh, days, then start the water going out in a soft manifest, and then in a very violent way, which produced a lot of 
land, land forms. Okay? Where's the water of the of the of the flood today? It's in the con in the in the ocean. The ocean is the water. So the the uh, speed and the force of that uh, turbulent turbulent water was up to one million in Reynolds Lambda. That is very destructive. Water can be very destructive when it can reach a lot of, of speed. This is a case when where a a tunnel was a, a, a dam a tunnel spillway was damaged in 1983 due to cavitation. What happened? This tunnel, the, the water was flowing here, but suddenly a rock came into position, and the rock produced cavitation. And the cavitation produced all this hole, not all the structure, the rear, everything it had just didn't work. It produced a big hole because the water is very powerful. We can see how this valley was carved also by water because of the speed and cavitation. Well, I told you already about the Grand Canyon. This is the Grand Canyon, probably this is where the lakes were up up in the in the area, the upper area, and that flow into it. Here's another satellite photo of the Grand Canyon. And other canyons also form like this. You see big uh, cuts in the mountains. And the gooseneck also, it's obvious that the water ran this way. And the horseshoe bend, and the spider rock, and so on. Now, this is a beautiful thing in, that God allows us to have, which are real events in today's time. And one of them is the eruption of Mount St. Helen in Washington State in the US. This was a volcano covered with ice, with glaciers. And one day, it had an explosion, and all the top of the mountain was just erased. So Mount St. Helen produced a big channel, a big uh, canyon like that, and with a lot of layers, just deposit in very short time, eight meters of layers like that. There's a man there, you see? And you can see all the layers. In 1980, Mount St. Helens in Washington state erupted. The explosion flattened 130 square miles of lush conifer forest in seconds, with volcanic ash flowing at 100 miles per hour. The avalanche of debris displaced much of Spirit Lake, causing a massive mud flow that carved a brand new canyon, 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon in one afternoon. So this was a real world experiment that you can see what happened when something catastrophic goes on. And you could see how it carved this canyon. You see, it says it was 1 40th of the size of the Grand Canyon. But you can see that how it carves in very short time. Also, the other thing that was known was that, but that's another view of the same canyon, that there was a lake, Lake Spirit, uh, down the river. and. He, the, that took all the 19,000 trees that were cut. And those trees, you can see, they are uh, free of leaves, they're free of, uh, of the roots. They just were clean because of the rolling. And you can see they're sitting there. But later on, when they uh, absorb water, they took a position, vertical position like that. And later, they sunk and they went into the sediments of the, of the lake. And that was very important because that was exactly what happened in the case of woods, petrified woods in Yellowstone, which evolution said, oh no, this is a proof that we have layers of millions of years of trees sitting vertically and doing exactly that. But now, you see, this shows why it went that way. So it's fantastic how things were learned by this example. Okay. The other thing that happens, there were uh, volcanoes that when the, the retrieving phase came, all the material around the volcanoes were just taken away by the, by the water, leaving the volcanoes as such as this. And this is a case. 
is called the Devil's Tower. You can see it there. And we have many other cases. Chip Rock in New Mexico, the Pyramid Rock in, in Victoria, also the Glass House here in, in Brisbane, and the Iris Rock in the middle of Australia, Stone Mountain in Georgia, Olgas in Northern Territory, and the Sugar Loaf in Rio de Janeiro. They're all called Inselbergs. Okay? Also, coal mines uh, were created by all this flood because a lot of shrubs and trees were buried into one big area. And they were pressure and temperature which produced these uh, coal layers. And the, well, the compression was 10 to 1 to produce this coal. Here's a case in the Latrobe Valley in Australian Victoria, where we have a lot of coal. That coal is called brown coal because it's low quality uh, coal and it's burned in these power stations. I worked in this power station for seven years, building those power stations in a team, and I was able to learn about this coal, you see, taken by these dredges and taken with <coughs> into the boilers. But you can take some from the conveyors and look at it, and you could see it was real vegetation. You could see it had the form of trees, and you could see the leaves, you could see the branches, you see, can see everything there. Because this brown coal wasn't black coal, which has been more, more processed, this was unprocessed. So that's why it's low quality. But you could see all the vegetation pre-flood. Fantastic. Just one case. What time do you want to go, by the way? It's 20 past 7. It's okay? You will not blame me later? No? Okay. All right. I want to show you this other case. This is a fish that was buried in a, um, in a place in uh, Germany. And it had uh, a very special feature in its fin, had the little bones like that. And this was said to be the special animal because it was placed there as the transition between a fish and an amphibian because of these little bones. He said, oh, this is the fish that uh, produce the bones and start having legs. And this was a special for all the um, evolutionists. Sorry, oh, by the way, sorry for the Spanish, but the images will tell you what I'm trying to convey. So in 1938, a fish like that was taken in the, in the nets of fishes in South Africa and happened that this was very similar to that animal or fish in, the, um, in Germany and it was called silicant. Later, in 1952, they took another sample from uh, the Comoros Islands and you see it's exactly the same with the same fin, with a hollow column and exactly, it's a special fish, but it's very, very similar. Another uh, sample there took later. And then in 1987, a team of the National Geographic went into a submarine 200 meters down, and they could find the silicon in their natural environment. And they were the, the silicon floating, living, eating, doing exactly what they do every day. And of course, didn't have any special uh, legs, just the same fins with the little bones, or the same hollow column, and they were just living naturally. So this is a living fossil that never, and evolution said that was being extinguished 60 million years ago, but there was alive. And the principal thing, no change, no evolution, right? So when you tell some, an evolutionist, oh, but this didn't change for millions of years in your timing. And they said, oh, yeah, no, because the, this, the design of evolution was so good that didn't, to do, didn't need to do any changes. You see, they always have a, uh, an answer, and that's the answer. <laughs> okay, but having said that, the um, silicon also were made a DNA test. So comparing them with the tetrapods, those animals with four legs. 
and they definitely did have, didn't have any similarity in the DNA. So there was not the case. Now, in Sydney, there is a, a sample of this silicon in the Australian Museum of Natural uh, Science. And you can see that silicon with a sign there. And what the sign says, well, you can read it. Silicons were, were thought to have become extinct some 90 million years ago in, in the Cretaceous. However, in 1938, a living silicon was netted in the Indian Ocean and called Latimeria. <clears throat> silicons are low fin fishes, one of the closest relatives of tetrapods. The first lie. One of the closest relatives of tetrapods, four-legged vertebrates, including ourselves. Some 70 species of silicons are known to have been lived between the Devonian and the Cretaceous. They reached their greatest diversity in the Triassic. Through this long history, including 90 million year gaps in the fossil history, silicons have undergone little uh, change in form. But you see, they still present the silicon as uh, our precursors, that they live before us, their four leg vertebrates, including ourselves. That's ridiculous, but they still is today in the Australian Museum. So the water stood above the mountains and they rebuked, they fled at the voice of thy thunder, they hasted away. The mountains rose, the valley sank unto the place until thou had found them. them. Uh, that's coming to the end of the flood. But some analysis I want to make about the fossilization. If a, if a fish just die on the sea, it rottens. At first it floats because uh, it swells. It uh, goes wide because of inflammation. Then the, the, the um, other fish will start eating it. And then the, the rest, all the bones, will go to the bottom. And in the bottom, they will be eaten by other uh, larvae and other things. But what happened when fossilization happened? Fish is happy, and then a mud comes on top of it, and it bury him with no oxygen and no scavengers, no holes. So it converts all the flesh, just disappear, and all the uh, bones are mineralized. But in Canberra, also, we have this. It says that when the, the fossil comes into the sea, da, it stays there for millions of years, and they're covered by many layers. And then some someday, just the layers are um, erosion, and then the fossil appears in millions of years, which is absolutely wrong. That does not happen. So we have graveyards in around the world, in many places, North America, South America, Africa, Australia, Asia, Europe, everywhere. But have you ever seen this? You see, it's a, like a big giant person with a person just digging and trying to discover. This is false. This is just Photoshop. Don't ever believe that, okay? A lot of people come with these photos asking me, oh, this is true. Did they find the giants that lived before the flood and all that? No, it's not true. Okay, so there was massive burial of fish around the world, everywhere, trilobites by millions, a bat and fish, crocodile and fish, in Germany, in Lebanon, a, this is a shark, and the, this is a special lemur uh, called Ida in Germany, the, again, a horse and fish all together, and 31, 31 iguanodons buried in Belgium in a pit. Was discovered by miners of coal, and they recovered all the remains, which were all scattered everywhere, and they rebuilt now this uh, museum in, in Bernissart in Belgium. Also in Ica, Peru, they found hundreds of thousands of whales and other animals like penguins, turtles, seals, dolphins, sloth, all together. And you can see there in the map, they were placed. But the interesting is about the whales. Because the whales uh, have a thing that is called baleens. These are the baleens, where they filter the microorganisms they're going to eat. But the baleens is well known that when they die in the sea, they will drop very easily 
in hours they will drop the uh, lens because the glue that takes them together is very soft. So that's the case. But in this case, all the whales have the balloons in place. So what's the meaning of that? Here are the balloons. What's the, what's the meaning of that? Means that all the, they were buried by surprise. Okay, so there were no time to miss their their balloons. This is another um, whales burial in Chile. <laughs> They're in, Peru, in Argentina, a nice big museum of all sorts of animals. In South Africa, in China, the Oping, in the United States, a big wall full of animals, um, marine and earth, uh, uh, earth animals all together in this wall. Big size of them, some of them. <laughs> Stegosaurs, dinosaurs, and in South Africa, another wall like this, with a lot of animals, a little bit different to the others, a lot of uh, bones that you can see there. And one interesting thing is that the animals, the dinosaurs that were killed, they, they have the head thrown back and the tail arced up as a typical death throw. You see, like that, like this, and like that. In one tag information, we have also some other fossils, dinosaurs. Um, this little uh, is in Winton Formation in Australia, in Queensland, a place saw, and then so on and so forth. Armadillos, this is in Germany, Archaeopteryx and ducks, Triceratops, Gobi, the Galbi Desert, thousands of animals, Rocky Mountains, a lot of uh, T Rex like that, in octopus in Lebanon. Octopus supposedly are not uh, able to fossilize, fossilize because they're very soft tissues, but here it is fossilized. Also jellyfish fossilized like that because of the condition. Like that also, the horse crab, uh, an Asiatic crocodile, turtle, more fish, more fish, poplars. And this ichthyosaurus is very special because it's two meters long, and it's in a museum in Germany, in Stuttgart. But the interesting thing is that specimen was uh, in the labor um, work. The baby Ictosiro was being born, you can see it there. It's very interesting, because this happened suddenly, because it was buried in a, very, in a surprise way. And when this animal goes out of the labor, the mom has to take it up to the surface immediately because they, are breathe, they breathe air. So you see, it was a very special moment. So sudden burial of uh, animals having their lunch, like that. And why human fossils are extremely rare? There, there are many reasons. First of all, God was looking to destroy wicked humans. And also, uh, it is believed that we're at that time, before the flood, 235 million people. All right? And they had the soft tissues were destroyed very quickly. And as I told you, they bloat and they float and then they go to the bottom. Also, this was a tsunami. And tsunami in the when this happened in, here in Asia, they, of 280,000 people that were died, 43,000 were never discovered where they were, were lost. So by the nature of a tsunami, a lot, a lot of people is buried and just lost. Okay, so in the Manti, Mount of Ararat in Turkey, the ark was stranded, was posed, and the animals went down. And uh, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. After, immediately after the flood, there was an ice age. And the ice age happens because the conditions were there. And the ice age was 30% of the earth, was not the full earth. 
So 30% of the Earth, all the continents, the northern part of the continent, and the Antarctica, and of course Greenland was part of it. Today, it's 10% of the, of the Earth is covered by uh, glaciers. But because of the water was sitting there, all the oceans were from 60 to 100 meters uh, lower. So a lot of surface of the today sea were at the air, open at the air, to the air, especially in this area of Australia. So it allowed a lot of traffic of animals and people. See? And of course, in the northern side, in the Bering Strait, they was able to cross from Europe into America through the Bering Strait because of the ice. <clears throat> now, if the world is destroyed, uh, how long it takes to recover? This is a case of it's called the Surtsey Island in Iceland. In 1963, just from the from the bottom of the sea came a volcano and produced a big island like this. That big island very soon had flies, had birds, and had vegetation like this. So in a time of approximately 10 years, it was fully uh, covered with vegetation and animal, little animals, little animals, not big animals. So how did they can transfer between one continent and an island through floating islands? Remember the Spirit Lake had a lot of trees? Well, in the sea there were millions of trees. So they could take them uh, through uh, currents to a different continent, like this, from Africa to Madagascar. You see, in those floating uh, islands, they could move little animals like lemur and, and rats and uh, rodents. So this is a sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So the rainbow means that there will be no more universal floods. They're not, there's not saying local floods, universal floods. There's a lot of legends of the flood. Uh, if we register around the world, we have about 250 stories that tell us about the flood. And they have coincidence that an ark was provided, a destruction by water, a human were saved, animals were saved. There was a universal destruction in most of the tales. And they cover from Assyria, Persia, Syria, Egypt, Italy, China, India. Every single culture in the world coincides in a lot of points. The Chinese word for a large ship is eight person in a boat. It's very interesting how, how they uh, create this. And the, to cover, to desire, is two trees, women, and that means to cover. A woman coveting, you know, the two trees, good and evil, and the good tree. And there's a tribe called the Miao tribe in southwestern China, which they have very nice traditions. What they do, <laughs> They, they have verses that they transmit generation to generation. And much before the Christian missionaries came into China, they had that tradition. And what they sing in that tradition was exactly that the God destroyed the world, that the flood caused, was caused because of the wickedness of man, that he names, uh, you hear this, they named Noah, there was a righteous man and his wife matriarch and their sons, Lohan, Loshem, which is Shem, and Jahu, which is Japhet. They survived and they continue in the verses by building a, a very broad ship and embark on it with a pair of animals. Their tradition also includes a, a story about creation, confusion of languages, and the, they talk about also of Gomer. So it's fantastic how they repeat the story of the Bible in that tradition. You see, so far from the, uh, the Jews or whatever. Yeah, again, there are traditions. And there are traditions also in Hawaii, in China, in Mexico, Babylonia, and everywhere. Just the last thing I want to tell you is about the Ark. Is the real Ark has been discovered where it is? 
there is a Chinese, Tur Turkish Chinese group in 2009 that they thought they had discovered. This is a group, and they had to go to that discovery in the middle of winter, when they could have done it in the middle of summer. And that, that was the first question. Why? The Turkish are taking the poor Chinese into the snow, like that. So they got into 4,200 meters of altitude, and there was a hole. And they could get into this place, and they find ladders, wooden ladders like that. This is ice, by the way. And they discover rooms like that. You can see the shape and the form of the, of the wood. And also seven rooms. One of them was even with hay. Another other one with uh, hangers. So and that, another big room like this, you see, looking like to be a giraffe uh, apartment. So they were so happy that they had discovered this, and they put a, a growing together, and they went to the news everywhere. But in a year's time, in summer, this man, Don Patton, visited the site, the same cave. He went in, and there was nothing there. And he only found pieces of wood which were new wood painted with ashes. And then the, the clearly was, this was a fraud. Why was it a fraud? Because the Turkish want to put this site in the news so all the tourists will come and produce a lot of millions of dollars. You see, but it was a fraud. The other one was Rodden White. He also was supposed to discover this uh, ark in a place called Durupina. And you can see all these lines. All these lines were drawn by him and his team, saying that these were structures of the ark on that side. And this is the drawing he made. So saying all these lines are structure, and all the points are the steel structure that were placed there. So that was absolutely, if you can see this, it's a reality. Definitely it's the ark. There's no other way to, that this will be produced by nature. This is man-made. But when the team went in and did the same uh, um, measurements with the same equipment, this was the result. It was only geological uh, information that came out. Nothing of this. So it was a fraud. And today we have three similar arcs there in the Ararat. It's just mud running down the hill and forming these shapes, but they're not shapes. So the search continues. This is the big Ararat and the small Ararat. The Ararat is a volcano so, and has erupted many times. So if the ark was ever here at the top, it will, would have been destroyed. Or maybe the people that disembark took all the pieces of the ark to build their own homes, to burn the, the, the wood. Whoever, who knows what, what happened. So some witnesses say that the ark is inside the glaciers, split by two, like that. We don't know if that any time in the future will be fine. God knows if this would be good or bad for humanity. There's another claim that is in the Sagros Mountain, which is in Iran. So that is a presentation of the flood.